Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Freddie Matthews. I'm the Director of Programme and Content here at The Conduit. And uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's Conduit webinar, Poles Apart, Why People Turn Against Each Other and How to Bring Them Together. Welcome to all the Conduit community members tuning in today. And for those not yet part of the community, please do consider visiting our website to find out more about the benefits of joining. Uh, joining us today are the authors of the book that anchors today's webinar, as well as being the creators of the acclaimed Change My Mind podcast. They are behavioral scientist Alex Chesterfield, managing director at London First, Laura Osborne, and the CEO of the Depolarization Project, Ali Goldsworthy. Uh, we're thrilled to have Conduit community member Sharit Jeevan moderating today's session, who is one of the world's leading experts on motivation and is the author of the newly published book, Intrinsic, a Manifesto to Reignite Our Inner Drive. So wonderful to have Sharit steering today's discussion. And so without further ado, uh, I'll pass over to Sharit. So please welcome Sharit. Hi, everyone. What a pleasure. It's going to be such an exciting hour ahead of us. Wanted to uh, say a big thanks to everyone at The Conduit for joining. I'm a founding member and a very big believer in, in The Conduit's um, mission and, and values. And I couldn't think of three more distinguished and uh, appropriate guests than, than Alison, Alexandra and Laura today to talk about this question of why we are pulls apart. Let me just show you my, my copy of the book. I'm sitting in The Conduit here today, but I really enjoyed this. I was on a, a trip to Zurich last week and um, that was my, my plane reading. It was nice to be back on a plane again. Um, but really, really enjoyed and resonated with the themes today. Um, so what we thought we would do today um, is to, first we'll just do a, a quick round of introduction so you know the authors. Um, then um, uh, ask uh, uh, the authors to share some of the ideas from the book in a nutshell. So give us a summary. We'll have a little bit of a Q&A um, with myself and the authors for about 15 minutes, but really want to spend most of the time today focused on, on your questions, and thoughts and perspectives. And I'll be moderating from the, the chat, the live stream, uh, sharing your questions with them and, and seeing what they think. So very excited, but can I please pass over to, can we do a quick round uh, guys as well? So great to have you all here today. Um, thank you so much for having us. So my name's Ali Goldsworthy. I'm one of the co-authors of Paul's Part. I suppose my background is in movement building and troublemaking and political advice. And then it became, pretty clear that the most rebellious thing that I could do was actually suggest that people from different political tribes try and get on with each other and work together. And that's part of what led us to write the book. I came out here to, to Stanford. I'm, I'm speaking to you from, from California. Um, and yeah, that's that was the genesis of our work and what we do and, and the ideas we're going to discuss today. Thanks, Ellie. I'll come in next. Hello, I'm Laura Osborne. I'm Managing Director of Corporate Affairs at London First in my day job, working very closely with businesses across the capital to uh, get it back on its feet after and during the pandemic. So, but uh, my background is in business and communication. So I uh, sort of refer to myself as a professional communicator. And I was really interested in how do you communicate across some of these divides and what role is business playing in either making them better or making them worse? Thanks, Thanks Laura. Hi, everyone. So I'm Alex Chesterfield. Um, I'm a behavioural scientist. I've always been really curious about why we do what we do and why we think what we think. Um, I was also active in politics for a, a different tribe to uh, Ali. Um, and after receiving yeah, a lot of very personal <laughs> abuse um, and, and also interesting experiences in the workplace as well, um, I decided to bring together my um, I guess professional uh, or profession and my political interest together, which was which was my personal motivation uh, to write the book to figure out well why do we divide and how can we bring people back together? Thanks, Alex. And one of the things I I know you're in the states, Ali, but uh, friends of mine who I think say they won't even uh, sit across the table from uh, some of the other parties that have uh, people writing a book together was itself quite mm -hmm. quite novel with different views, which was uh, a really great way to segue into this, but. Um, I was really fascinated by and really uh, the themes and really enjoyed the book because some of the work I've been exploring is why is it so difficult for our leaders in countries to have deep conversations with citizens? And I think you, you made a lot of ground in terms of thinking about that and uh, and helping us think through how we can bring people together. So very excited. Um, I think Ali, are you going to uh, take share some slides with us as well? 
Yeah, I am. I promise uh, to everybody listening, we don't have too many slides um, and it would be lovely if people have got questions, do check them in and as possible, we'll try and answer them as we're going through or Sharon will pick them up um, at the end. Um, but I'm very, very uh, excited to uh, be here talking about Poles Apart um, and uh, today. Um, so one of the things I do is just as we're talking, have a think about when was the last time that you changed your mind on a reasonably substantive issue? And what is it that you think caused you to change your mind? And Sharon, just to advance warning, I might come to you and, and ask this question um, as well at some point. And, and just hold on to that. It's, it's quite a tricky thing to do. Um, and we'll, we'll use that as an exercise to try and prompt discussion afterwards. And you can, of course, ask Laura, Alex and I what we've changed our minds about, because it's intrinsically tied to how difficult it is, um, polarisation. Now, when we talk about polarisation, particularly at the minute, a lot of people think about images like this one from the, the Capitol building. So that's Washington, D.C. Um, in January this year, where there was, you know, very, very significant protests and democracy was in, in pretty serious peril, um, you know, with the, the storming of, in effect, their, their parliament building. Um, and actually, the thing about polarisation is it's, it's often much, much wider and broader than that. And it's not not just in America, although a lot of the research that has been done is in the US. And we'll try and flag that and where we think those differences may or may not affect how, how we could or should respond. So where is polarisation a problem? Well, clearly in America at the minute, as Sherrod said at the start, there's, you know, uh, polarisation has extended to where people can't do Thanksgiving dinners or where they're shorter, where people from different political tribes are, are sitting together and where political adverts beforehand um, make those dinners even shorter in themselves. But there's plenty of other places that polarisation exists around the world. And we'll talk about what exactly we mean by polarisation in a second. So Here's a few of them where that polarization has been shown to exist and often in ways that are bigger than in the US. So if people think about Greece in the aftermath of the financial crash or um, in Turkey with Erdogan here in the UK, and we'll talk about that a bit more, you know, between leave and remain and, and in Australia about climate change, it, it does go on and on. So it's important to not just think about this in terms of America or think that it isn't really an issue that affects us um, too. I'm going to pass over to Alex, who's going to talk very briefly about exactly what we mean by polarisation. Thanks, Ali. So when we when we think about polarisation, um, we typically think uh, about issues and how far apart people are on uh, different issues or different sets of issues. But increasingly, identity is also a really important part of the picture. So in case you're thinking, what, what exactly do we mean by identity? Identity is about really about who we are. And who we are is at least partly about the groups that we belong to or psychologically identify with. So it could be gender, could be nationality, it could be a generation, so I'm a millennial, um, or it could be a political party. And when we when we think about ourselves in terms of the groups that we belong to, we know from decades of social science that uh, people increasingly dislike and distrust the other side, and and it triggers a whole host of positive feelings towards um, the team or the group that that we identify with irrespective of whether or not they actually agree or disagree uh, on, on a particular issue. So this phenomena is called affective polarisation. And with affective polarisation, feelings become much more important than facts. Partisan labels um, almost become to act as, as proxies uh, for differences in beliefs, values and behaviours that go far beyond political consideration. So, for example, I'm sure if I even just mentioned the term Brexiteer or Remainer, that will bring uh, in your heads a whole host of um, images and uh, feelings and, and beliefs about people, the kinds of people that would support one or both of those uh, positions. So this effective polarisation is, is much more about who we are um, or who we are not, uh, much more than, than ideas or beliefs. So let's let's look at this a bit more. Um, if we're on to the next, the next slide. Um, so when um, when we think about you know humans and, and who we are humans are fundamentally a uh, a social species now has everyone got the slides yeah that's all good yeah right so humans were fundamentally social species identify with a group 
whether it's a social class, family, uh, football team, uh, leave or remain, it's really essential to our sense of self. It gives us a source of pride and self-esteem. So it makes us feel good when we, when we, when we belong to something. Now, effective polarization as it has its roots in something called social identity theory that was developed by a psychologist called Henry uh, Tajvel. And Henry found that we like to put people into in-groups and out-groups, which, and this is the key point, that alters then how we behave towards people in our in-group and how we behave towards people in our out-group. And Tajvel found that this process of categorizations and we put, put people into in-groups and out-groups has three stages. So first of all, you categorize. So this is at the bottom of the slide. First of all, we categorize. Um, I said, and it's it's a it's a really it's a really uh, effective way from the evolutionary perspective to help uh, simplify our increasingly complex world. So once we've categorized people, you know, um, uh, tall, short, um, you know, family, not family, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, people tend to adopt an identity. So that could be, again, think about when you're buying a football shirt or we adopt the local dialect when we move to a, a new uh, country. Ali, I note that you still you still haven't, you don't, <laughs> don't sound American yet, but you might do. And then once we've adopted the identity of the group that we've categorized ourselves as belonging to, um, we then inherently compare ourselves. Um, and we, we like to compare favorably, naturally, uh, for our group compared to uh, the other group. And another consequence of this process is that we, tend to um, look to reduce diversity in the out group. So when we think about the other side, the other team, um, we typically see people all as the same, even actually if they, even if they aren't. Now, so the key point of this process is that how we categorize people into in groups and out groups then influences um, our behavior. And there's, I'm gonna briefly describe a, an experiment um, from a professor at Exeter University called Mark Levine, um, which illustrates the importance of uh, group identity for how we behave. So let me just describe that uh, briefly now. So what Mark and his colleagues did uh, in, in the university setting was enlist fans of Manchester United to participate in a psychology experiment. And the participants were told that this was all about um, football. And in the first part of the study, they had to fill in a questionnaire um, about their allegiance to Manchester United. So this is what this was doing behind the scenes was reinforcing people's feelings of identification with the football team that they supported. Now, once they'd done that, the experimenters then told the participants that the second part of the study was in a different location. They had to walk to a different university block. Um, so they gave them the directions and sent the participants on their way. Now, as they were walking on their way from one university block to the second university block, an actor, uh, working with the experimenters uh, was jogging and fell over right next to the participants. Now, obviously, the participants didn't know that the person who fell over was an actor, um, but that was that was behind the scenes. Anyway, so this person fell over, was shouting and screaming in pain. And the key question the experiments were to answer was, do the Manchester United fans do anything to help the poor guy who had fallen over on the pavement and was grabbing his ankle in pain? Now, what they found was that it depends. So the experimenters found that whether someone on, whether someone helped the person on the floor depended on which football shirt the actor was wearing. So in some conditions, the actor was wearing a Manchester United shirt. In other conditions, uh, the actor was wearing a Liverpool shirt. And in, and in a third condition, the actor was wearing an unbranded shirt. Now, um, the results is that are really, really uh, compelling. So when the actor or the person on the floor was wearing a Manchester United shirt, 92% of people stopped to help him, so most. However, when the person on the floor was wearing a Liverpool shirt, only 30% of people stopped to help him. Um, and it was the same figure in an unbranded shirt. So I'll just repeat that. When the person in pain was wearing a Manchester United shirt, 90% 90, 90 stopped to help. When the, when the person was wearing a Liverpool or unbranded shirt, only 30% stopped to help. So it just shows the power of the group and how that affects um, our behavior. Now, if we, uh, if we skip on, um, evidence um, suggests that our, our, you know, our ancient capacity for tribalism, so putting people into groups and then behaving differently towards them, is exacerbated by some of the wider forces that we are increasingly seeing in today's modern world. So for example, economic inequality is, is strongly correlated to increasing levels of, of polarization, which means 
that we have more haves, we have more have nots, but also increased uncertainty. And again, we know from the literature that where people feel more uncertain, they're more likely to cling to their group identities because it makes us feel reassured and that we that we belong. So effective polarization um, in a nutshell, as we move on, is, is going to impact you, even if you think it's not going to, and especially if you think it's not going to. So just think about if you define yourself as against someone or for something, is that is that mainstream? And these forces are really, really strong. So again, reiterate, even if you think it's not going to be affecting you, it very uh, it probably it probably is. And one last one last example for me. So um, as I said, this study illustrates exactly that point that even if we don't think it affects us, it likely is in our day to day worlds and even in contexts very unrelated to uh, to politics. So every day we I'm sure all of us encounter problems that we have to solve. And often when we get stuck on something, we ask people for advice. And often a problem might only have a handful of experts that we turn to. So, for example, if I was looking on uh, about intrinsic motivation, I would be now turning uh, to to Sharat. Um, but what the evidence suggests is that actually we don't always go to the experts on a particular subject. So our group membership can have so much power over us that it shapes our perception of competence well beyond that person's sphere of activity or uh, expertise. And this study conducted by academics from UCL and Harvard um, ask people to uh, turn to people for advice um, on a shape sorting exercise. So something really mundane, or something really unrelated to politics. Um, in that instance, you'd think you just want to have the best shape sorter. But this rigorous study found that people uh, given the task of categorizing different shapes were much more likely to turn to peers with similar political views um, to help, even when they knew that that person was likely to be worst at shape sorting, they still chose the person with the same political views as them over perceived competence on the task um, at hand. So not only does our partisanship make us more biased, it also makes us more blind to expertise. So essentially we put loyalty to the group above objective truth um, and accuracy that sometimes uh, can get can get better results. And this can lead to many unintended consequences and what we call spillover effects. So Laura, over to you. Thank you. And apologies if I cut out, I am having some internet connection issues, so I'll do my best. And I'm sure one of my colleagues will take over if I disappear. But yes, it's fascinating because one of the things I was really interested in is when the effects of polarization move into other spheres. So you might think that, for example, when fund managers are making investment decisions, they're immune to these types of issues, um, but they're not. There's data that shows that people vote, uh, rather they put their money with co-partisan funds and they are not aware that they're doing that. So there are some very uh, serious connotations in the real world and that includes who we buy from. So there's studies that show that we are more comfortable making purchases where our partisanship matches that of the seller and it even influences the medical advice that we take that we are given, particularly in the US around those more political healthcare decisions, but also whether we enroll, for example, in health insurance or not. Uh, and there are real kind of real world implications there. And one of those extends into the job market. So we can be quite biased in our hiring towards people's partnership based on the cues they give us in both their CVs and their cover letters, something we might not be fully aware of. So if we can go on to the next slide. This really illustrates, I think, really well uh, the point that Alex was making about identity. So, you know, really, this is effective polarisation in action. We perceive the us as the blessed homeland, the glorious leader, the noble population and the them as the as the all the other things on the other side of the slide. So and that plays out in practice within individual divisions as well. If we can move on to the next slide. So you can see the impact of effective polarization in the leave and remain debate here. So leavers perceive other leavers as intelligent, open minded, honest, all of those great characteristics and remainers unsurprisingly perceive remainers as intelligent, open minded and honest. But when you look at the flip of that, the groups perceive the out group as much more selfish, hypocritical and closed minded than the people they themselves identify with. So all importantly, what can we all do about it? I'm going to pass back to you here, Alex. 
Thanks, Laura. Um, so I think the first thing is don't just throw people with uh, different group identities, you know, from us and them in a room together. Um, so again, loads of uh, research and evidence has shown that actually that can backfire and people can become more entrenched um, and their beliefs can become stickier. So instead, showing people uh, something they have in common first can be really effective. And to illustrate this point, I want to take you back to the football experiment by Mark Levine and colleagues that I went through um, a moment ago. So Levine and his colleagues uh, conducted a second experiment. And in this experiment, they recreated the conditions of the other study, but with one important twist. So if you remember in the first study, the academics got the participants to fill in a questionnaire about their allegiance to Manchester United. This time, instead of giving people questionnaires that emphasise their specific team allegiance, they gave them questionnaires emphasising their allegiance to love of football, so the love of the game. Other than that, everything was same as the everything was exactly the same. Sorry, as the first experiment. And what do you think happened? Um, so, like in the other study, people were pretty helpful when the person on the floor in pain was a Manchester United fan. So again, a similar proportion stopped to help. But this time, they were also helpful. So again, a similar proportion, 70%, also stopped to help if the person on the floor was wearing a Liverpool shirt or a neutral shirt. So simply by helping people to find common ground first um, and what unites us rather, rather than what divides us, um, translated into that poor guy on the floor getting helped uh, a lot more. Um, just in terms of on that last point, one of the other things that can help you find common ground is also by modelling and leading and demonstrating that you've changed your mind. And I think, you know, we asked people to think about this at the start and hopefully we'll have some, some discussion on it very shortly. But um, it can be really hard to change your mind away from your group. Um, and often, like the that can just be about perception and asking people about how they came to a position rather than why they came to a position and try and help work out the steps in between and doing that. It's got a, um, we'll hopefully take some questions on it, but it's got a, 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 a posher name, which is the illusion of explanatory depth, is that can be a really good way to try and unpick and make it easier for both you and others to change their mind. But, you know, we like to think that we decide things all based on the issues and on facts. And in reality, almost all of us, myself included, and, and probably you too, this groupish dynamics can have a thing. Now, we know we're talking to a bunch of leaders and one of the other things that you can do is is model behavior saying you don't know sometimes when you really don't know the answer very often we reward people for for bluffing well actually it should be okay to say you don't know if it's not in your area of expertise and to go and find out it is much harder to change your mind once you've taken a position and particularly if you've taken that position publicly than it is to just say I'm not sure I'll get back to you and that's a really important point that I think a lot of us could try and remember work out who we reward when they behave in that way so if you want to find out more ideas about how to try and reduce polarization and really unpick with many more experiments and applications the real world that Laura and Alex were talking about then you can find them in polls apart this is a really complex um, uh, area. This is a Gordian knot. Often we have a slide in here with Avril Lavigne singing, it's complicated, um, but we, we pulled it for time reasons this time, but it, it really is. It can be quite complex, but we hope we've given you a quick introduction to both the ideas in Poles Apart and how to understand one of the hugest challenges that's facing us today and what we could all do about it. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, um, Ali, Alex, and, and Laura as well. Such a fascinating overview. Um, so if I took a, took away sort of a, an overall summary from, from my summary, let me check if I've got this right. But you know, I, I'd known before about the, the value of weak ties and um, um, uh, and and sort of why that was important for us to have broader networks. What what really made this very powerful for me was a sense that basically we're going to be happier, healthier, wiser. Um, and, and more fulfilled if we have are able to work with people from very different perspectives and bring them together as, as a key takeaway. Is that fair? First of all, just to share. Um, yeah, I think that, that that is fair. And actually, the book, you know, is, as Alex mentioned, she was from a conservative leaning, I was a, a Lib Dem. Um, and it's, you know, I undoubtedly am often better for the challenge and perspective that people from 
different backgrounds bring to me. It's not always easy or comfortable to do that. Um, and it isn't, you know, as Alex touched on the presentation, you have to build these things thoughtfully. You can't just chuck people in a room and ask them to, to try and, and do stuff. But yes, you know, there is evidence that things like scrutiny happens better, innovation and things like that. When you have, you know, diverse perspectives that are coming in, I should be slightly cautious here because, you know, it, there's a lot of parallels with the diversity and inclusion debate. I don't think in any way are we suggesting that like political viewpoints should be a, to use British parlance, protected characteristic in the same way that race or gender or disability are. But some of the principles definitely do carry across. Thanks, Ellie. And what I'd love to do is just spend a bit of time just thinking about, okay, we're brought into this, it's a very compelling message. How do we do so? And I think the first one is, you know, as, as individuals, whether we're leaders or in an organization, we're members of the conduit, you know, how do we, what's the best one or two things we can do to understand someone else's beliefs and, uh, and, and sorry, sort of better understand the logic in our beliefs, first of all, and test our own logic to begin with? I'm happy to, yeah, I'll start off and then hand over to Ali and Laura if they want to build Thanks. on my, my response. So I think first of First of all, I guess an unashamed plug is to read the book. Um, so I think understanding um, what what is happening um, amongst in ourselves, but also with our colleagues, friends, uh, maybe people that we don't don't agree with, uh, can create a level of self awareness, um, and we can start to recognise situations in which someone's identity can lead them to prioritise loyalty to the group and that group's values and beliefs. Um, versus truth and accuracy, and I use it actually all the time. You know, at work, I find it useful. Okay, this conversation now is is uh, is straying into a place. Is that because of uh, who who we are identifying with? But one, let me go down a bit more concretely. One really helpful concept here is something called the illusion of explanatory depth. So Ali picked up on it a moment ago, and this is the tendency to believe that we actually understand things far more uh, precisely and coherently than we actually do. So I'm sure we've all had the experience of being able to ask to explain something that we thought we knew all about mm. um, and finding ourselves floundering. An example we often ask, so Sharat, for example, is, is, you know, how confident do you feel in explaining how a fridge works or how a toilet flushes or how a zip works? Could you? Yeah, could yeah, you... Very, could I, could I do it? Yeah, no, sorry, I was just thinking if I had to explain this to my, I've got a 10 year old and seven year old um, um, Alex as well, that I would not be a very good explainer. I could give maybe a a little bit of a brush, a sort of very superficial answer, but I really have no idea what I was talking about more deeply, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. And that's really, really common is that we think, oh, yeah, I know, I know how a toilet flushes. And then actually, when you have to explain it mechanistically, so step by step, that's when we typically find ourselves um, floundering. Exactly. Or moving closely to the debate of this uh, topic, you know, why a policy that we support or despise um, is, is actually hopelessly flawed. So research suggests, this is the really important bit, that if we're asked to explain the basis of our understanding of our beliefs, we may find ourselves actually confronting what mm -hmm. underpins those beliefs and actually that they're more fragile than we think, which means we then moderate our beliefs accordingly. And this process is called mechanistic and it involves getting ourselves or others to explain a particular belief or policy position and showing step-by-step, step, that's the really critical mm -hmm. part, how it works. And as I said, researchers have found that when people are brought face to face with the fact that they don't know as much as they thought, um, they tend to become less extreme. So if you think about this in, the, in a more polarized context, this becomes a really useful tool. And again, what we find is that arguments, when people argue about why they believe what they believe, they typically rely on on values um, and hearsay and general principles which don't typically require much um, knowledge they're really hard to counter and they, they trigger a defense an immediate dense response in ourselves um, but what we find is that when you pierce that bubble of certainty um, that confidence that misplaced confidence lessens as an extreme uh, views are weakened and in the process we start to realize actually our ideas are not us so what we want is that separation of what you believe is not necessarily um, you, because that then creates the room for alternative perspectives to be considered. So just to end on for listeners, before you commit yourself to a policy position, ask yourselves to explain mechanistically how you think it will bring about the intended outcome. So it could be climate change, you know, taxation, gun laws, euthanasia, the UK referendum, then don't simply justify it or explain why, write down or explain to someone else how you think that will achieve its design outcome and that will help you, um, according to the science, um, moderate. Um, Laura, Ali, anything else that you want to add to that? 
There is definitely something, I think there, Alex, as well, about opening up space. So there's a number of different ways we talk about in the book on how you can do that, you know, how you can slow down. You know, you may be familiar with the craftivist movement who bring people together to undertake a shared task, which then enables them to have a different type of conversation. And there is definitely a lot of evidence from different places about the way our brains respond to that slowness, that in that sort of mindset, we can listen better, we can be more curious, we can ask ask better questions and all of that helps to build up sort of take down some of those default barriers we might put up to hearing the other side or being open to some alternate perspectives and that can be very helpful in all manner of settings so from the workplace you know right through to the Thanksgiving dinner as Ali said at the outset. Thanks Laura and thanks Alex and I'm just going to ask also in terms of um that idea of, of reaching out. So I think a lot of this really relies on people or assume people are motivated to want to go out and talk to people. Many I think thinking about many, many people I know the conduit, many people will want to do so, but there are barriers around, it feels a bit uncomfortable. You know, I think in, in Britain, certainly we're, we're very comfortable with small talk, trying to get into actual deep discussions about what we believe can be at a dinner party, something can, can be seen as a no-no, for example. How, how do we do this practically? How do we reach out and and, and sort of have these these ideas tested and, and challenged in terms of our views? Well, it, it's interesting that you mentioned small talk. So one of the examples I'll, I'll often talk about is, you know, when I was younger, I'd go to meetings with my bosses with like quite high profile people. Mm. And we'd have an hour long meeting and these guys would spend 55 minutes gassing on about nothing, you know? <laughs> and I'd be like, we got, look, we've got loads of stuff to do here. Can we can we do it? And, and then in the last five minutes, they'd agree pretty much everything very quickly. Mm. And what I now realize having written the book they were doing was actually establishing common ground beforehand. Mm. I'm really going through that. So there is a value in like some small talk. I'm not sure it always needs to go on quite as long as it did in those meetings. But like there is, you know, actually that those niceties, they they can have a point when they're they're done, they're done pretty well. Um mm. there is then, you know, actually admitting that you changed your mind or you've got something wrong or things like that mm. does require both a certain level of, of self-confidence and you know Alex or, or might be able to talk about this a bit more sort of a psychologically safe environment where you feel mm. that you're not going to be hugely penalized for for doing that and that's that's part of what we touched on in the the presentation that leaders can have a responsibility for making that okay and, and model that behavior Alex I don't know if you want to pick up the psychological safety point yeah, so psychological safety is the idea, um, it's it's from Amy Edmondson, so she's a Harvard academic, um, and it's all about um, the propensity of people to take what's called an interpersonal risk in the workplace by speaking up, saying they don't know, challenging something, uh, saying they've made a mistake, etc. Um, and when, when she says interpersonal risk, what that means is, is not taking a physical risk, obviously, it means more taking a risk that you, by saying something out loud, you might actually... Um, uh make yourself look uh bad it might hurt your ego it might hurt your career prospects etc and you can take that that concept and it's similar to the conversations you have in in politics and as ali was saying by admitting a vulnerability up front especially if you're in a position of power or status that can really then influence others to then also admit their vulnerabilities or that they have changed their minds um so again it just it just starts to weaken there's more extreme um, positions. One other thing that I was going to point, I was going to build on on Ali's response is that, again, once that you've established that common ground, um, would recommend avoiding challenging um, what you perceive as false information. Mm -hmm. And again, instead, one approach that's been shown to work is to say, not that something isn't true, but that the opposite is true. So for example, um, if someone says John is not a criminal, um, what that does is it rem it makes people remember John is a criminal or, or for example earlier on this year when there was a petrol crisis the government saying there is not a petrol crisis it just means people remember crisis and petrol which is not what we want so instead um, what's called a corrective affirmation can work so i.e saying the opposite is true so again in the example of John instead of saying John is not a criminal um, saying John is exonerated instead Laura, is there anything else you wanted to build on on that? I was just going to say, or as the government probably uh, reflected on afterwards, there is plenty of petrol. Uh, yes. But yes, there are certain messaging, uh, things that can be done to make it easier for everyone to take the same thing away from something. Um, but also, you know, one of the 
one of the challenges that remains is still that need, as you said, to be in a place where you want to have those conversations, where you want to do things. And so, you know, as we try to draw out in the book a bit, there is also a responsibility for the groups that we belong to, for the systems that we operate within, because otherwise it is a very big ask of just the individual to sort of fix fix the situations we find ourselves in um, piece by piece, although there are certainly things we can all do to make it better. Thanks, Lauren. I'm just going to ask a, a question, ask a couple of questions, but just would love to ask uh, those um, uh, watching and listening to just enter some questions in the chat, and, and I'll feed them back to the, uh, our three co-authors today as well. But the other question I was going to ask, I mean, building on what you said, um, Alex and, and Laura, just now, that this takes, I was listening to Jeffrey uh, Pfeffer at Stanford, not too far from where you are, Ali, and uh, on a podcast today, he was talking about how leaders, you know, who, who look confident are so much more valued, and leaders who are doubtful, who are vulnerable, are punished in, in the world of careers, for example. How do we get around that? How do we build cultures where this is uh, not just accepted, but actually embraced to be able to change minds? But politicians are obviously our worst culprits, but corporate CEOs are not too much better, I think, in, in that those stakes. Yeah, Jeff's a, a fantastic guy. And I mean, obviously, after people have read our book, they should look at reading his book, Power, which explains quite a lot of this, you know, in, in some detail. And here's a fantastic line, which is, for most people, be yourself is terrible advice, unless you're Oprah Winfrey, basically. Um, and, and he talks about, you know, authenticity cannot always be helpful you know and and he sort of says we reward as a society people who who front up or who who try and bluff their way through very often um now one of the key underlying things actually from that with jeff is tooling people up to detect when that happens and in various ways politely or, or not depending on the circumstance calling them out for it so some of the stuff that alex said you know say someone well okay how did you take that view or you know what is it that you know when do you think that might not be the case and and just going for that and then there's some some other initiatives that we're involved in the, you know, the try and help reward. I, I run these civility and politics awards with um, Michael Quick and, and Lord Wood, where we try and reward politicians who have thoughtfully reflected on their positions because mm. that's so rare and to try and get people from different political tribes to nominate each other. And there is definitely something for people from the Conduit Club, you know, like if you are at an event and i'm sure all of us have you know and i'm aware of my own pattern recognition here but it tends to be white men sometimes from a panel bluffing their way through actually maybe more often i should sit there on the floor and be like i think you would like overstating your case there you know i really liked the quieter and more thoughtful way that somebody else did it you know and those kind of things where there are people in positions of power as you are now uh but in terms of chairing this panel that that can help and and can be really effective but you know yeah we like we like certainty and people who are confident project certainty mm -hmm. and and make us feel better that's one of the challenges here i think yeah, yeah i think and... oh sorry laura you go oh i'll just be quick alex then you come back in but i was gonna say that's absolutely true and i think that is one of the real challenges is how we respond to uncertainty because a lot of the time as humans it's not very well and so we look for certainty and as you say we look for that from leaders but almost that means uh, particularly if you think of times in a pandemic you know we are looking for things that we can't really have from people who are therefore going to make things up and that's quite a difficult situation to be in and it's a difficult situation for accountability and scrutiny then of what comes afterwards so you know we are all sort of part of you know as humans all part of that problem but you know, as we've said before the upside of that is we can all be part of the solution just very briefly i was going to think one one final point on that is that i guess leadership and which style of leadership um is works best is really context dependent as well so mm -hmm. clearly in a crisis situation um, as a leader, you maybe you know showing your vulnerability um, or is is not necessarily the the best thing first off. Um, but in other situations, it is. And over the longer term, and this is my second point. Over the longer term, I'd be interested in. I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who um, is an academic at a business school in how do business models change their models of leadership so then businesses can start rewarding those more alternative um, models that don't always reward confidence and certainty. Thanks, thanks, Alex, and um, thanks, uh, and as well, clearly enjoying the discussion here on the chat. But please jump, throw some questions in, guys, in the chat if you if you have any there. I want to ask one other question in the meantime, which is around. Um, what is it uh, that you've yes. changed your mind on? Oh, so and you're going to grill me as well? Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so, 
<laughs> Thanks, Ali. So, yeah, so I think, um, so I, I was talking when I, I sort of set out in the first story in, in my book, actually, it was all about this crazy story where I spent the last 10 years of my life working in education. And um, I set up a, an organization that first of all tried to uh, really find great teaching ideas from around the world, because from the poorest parts of the world. And what happened is in those first few uh, months working in the slums of Delhi um, in India, just came across so many teachers who we were trying to find the ideas from. And by accident, we were kind of reigniting their motivation. And it wasn't planned for, you know, we had a sort of, we were funded by the UK government, by various foundations and so on. Uh, this wasn't at all in the plan. And what we realized though, would completely confuse the baby with the bathwater. And I've got to admit, I was probably the, the, one of the people who was most stubborn. It was my sort of, I was founding it. So I felt this responsibility, people you know, who give us money and believed in us to follow the path we'd, uh, um, we'd set out to do. But we kept getting our office in Delhi, kept getting phone, phone calls for days. Literally, that was the only thing that was happening. From teachers saying, look, you've ignited something in us. Um, there's, um, yeah, you made us feel like, remember why we became a teacher in the first place. And I think that groundswell of opinion, rather than any kind of brilliance on my part, almost the opposite, um, I think really convinced us we had to be open and vulnerable and change our mind. But when I sort of deconstruct what happened there, I think it was that, I think it was so direct that feedback from people whose lives we were trying to impact. And we couldn't sort of put ourselves in a nice office and shut ourselves off from that feedback. And it wasn't an expert that I was, you know, I wasn't trying to have some intellectual debate with another education expert. It was really more, really, really, in, almost innocently from teachers themselves talking. I think it was just hard to say no to that, I think, as well. So I'm not sure if there's anything transferable in that story that you picked up, but that, that certainly was my experience there, I think, as well. Well, I think there really is something actually transferable in what mm. you said there, which is, you know, one of the bits about leadership in terms of polarization is like one, recognizing others' expertise and two, being able to, you know, take some perspective from them. And many mm. of the most successful leaders, you know, the one we, we use in the book actually is, a, a you know, a Suarez, who was in Spain post-Franco and how he healed the country um, at that, that point. And many of it was by working with others and bringing people from different tribes in, but also mm. really listening to them and accepting that he might be wrong. So I think you're modeling exactly what we what we talk about. Mm. And also we found on the podcast that a lot of people who had changed their minds were really impacted by a direct experience they themselves had been mm. through. So in lots of different examples, it was having some sort of common experience with someone else who had a different perspective and seeing mm. that up close and firsthand and being in that sort of slightly receptive mindset in that kind of position where perhaps you were more willing to see or, or as you said you had to see it because it mm. was right there has has changed minds we've definitely heard a, a theme around mm. that experience makes sense thanks Laura as well on that and so a couple of uh, questions in the chat thanks guys um but I think a similar sort of strain about the role of technology and social media Ali is someone based right in the heart of all this so right now in big tech um I, you know, I met Tony Blair a few years ago, and he was talking about how, you know, when he was prime minister in the UK, there was a national conversation. You can um, uh, you could talk to a whole country. Now we've got the echo chamber of, of social media. We follow only people we already believe in. First of all, what can we do as individuals, and what should what should big tech do? Well, wow. so I'll pick a few bits and pieces. I suspect I might disagree with a few of the followers here. This is um, people want to continue this offline or outside the event on, on Twitter and things like that. So firstly, for a lot of people, echo chambers don't really exist or certainly not in the way that we think they do. If you're a hyper partisan, then often, you know, like you like to listen to people like you. But one of the most motivating factors is not that you are only hearing from people like you you're often most motivated by people you really disagree with and you'll be like oh my god have you seen what this person is up to and what they're saying so like that's not quite the echo chamber that you only hear things that that people agree with and i'll say this you know as a former movement builder who used to raise lots of money and get millions of people to take action it was often much much more effective for me to share things of people doing something outrageous in terms of generating engagement than it was in terms of saying 
oh, well, here's some people who already agree with you. So that's, I guess, one of the, the first things to pick up. And different platforms have different ways. So the, the general tendency, and let's say, let's, let's start with Twitter and Facebook, for example, um, the general effect of these platforms is that they mute moderates and they amplify extreme voices um, because it becomes really hard to say, you know, I don't know, or I'm not certain, or try and pick things up. So those people who are feeling that way tend to just keep quiet. And then you end up with like a a distorted view of what the other is by some of the very loud voices that are there. And that can definitely fuel polarization. And again, if you're someone who used to do a job like I do and get people to share um, share online, like when they've supported a campaign or what their view is or who they dislike, once you've taken that position publicly, it can become harder to undo it. So on the whole, many of those things can be polarizing forces. That's not the same of every platform or every part of every platform. People who, you know, will think during the pandemic, things like buy nothing groups on Facebook have actually been tremendously helpful for people. I gave birth in the pandemic, my word, having people I'd never met be able to help me in the middle of the night with what was going on was great. But if people want to find somewhere which has very strong norms, actually, there's a fantastic subreddit called Change My View, which has a way of rewarding people people who change their position, they've got what's called delta points. And I'd encourage people to go and, and have a look at that. But you know, on the whole, our online environments, and particularly the monetized parts of the online environment, are driven by eyeballs and driven by engagement and division and polarization can be a very profitable way for them to go. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. And I just want to ask there, do you think that some of this could be is this something we need to do, you know, earlier on in life? So I'm thinking about, you know, I've been doing some work with the, the Economist um, Foundation, for example. They do a lot of things getting um, school children around uh, the world really to come and talk about current issues, but in a way that is genuinely um, open, where they try and explore different views. You know, we don't have much of a civics education left in the UK. I think in the US, it's not much better these days. But is, is this something we need to do more at the level of an education system much earlier? Or do you think tech can can play a role here or is it really up to us as individuals? I'm just curious where the, the bulk of our effort and energy needs to go. So it's up to up to a bit of everybody. And I mean, these groupish dynamics get triggered and Alex will pick up hopefully on this uh, jigsaw education example and, and an example of where, where things have been done well, it's used in the US and, the, and in the UK. But, you know, these recognising who is who is safe and who is not safe in effect, you know, who's your family and who's not, is one of the earliest things that babies and young children start to do. So that, that ties into everywhere. And, you know, there are places in the UK, so I'm, I'm Welsh people, the lingering aspects of my and might remain, you know, where civics education is is different. A guy called Chris Carman up at Glasgow has shown that actually it can often help in terms of engagement where there is though there is good civic education. So Wales had votes at 16, for example, at the last um, assembly election. So England is is lagging behind. But one thing that I, you know, this this is quite a nascent area actually studying the effects of polarization and on politics and one of the things that i one of the rocks i'd love to lift is when people start getting young people start getting really involved in politics if they're a bit weird like i was and joined a political party at 16 then you know actually that becomes your tribe and you start holding on to it really very tightly and we don't do very much in terms of education to help people understand how to bridge those divides particularly when they're political you reward people for doing activism and you know i've had conversations conversations with many of the leading youth groups in the UK who've developed things to try and help involve people get involved help people get involved in politics which is excellent it's a brilliant brilliant thing but at no point have they been like oh we might be triggering polarization dynamics how do we help them understand and navigate what can be incredibly powerful feelings you know being a teenager is already complicated enough without without layering that on top I'll pass over to Alex to talk about a great example of this jigsaw education one Yes, yeah, so there's a there's a social psychologist in the states called Elliot Aron Aronson Aronson, and he developed something called the jigsaw method, um, which tries to uh, teach children from an early age to uh, collaborate um, across maybe individual differences rather than to compete. And again, often the educational system will emphasize or focus on you know individual competitiveness. So think about test scores and grades rather than actually working together. Um, and in a, in a nutshell, what this jigsaw method does is get kids uh, to work on different parts of a problem and then to share their learning with each other. So, for example, say the school subject was Hitler, 
some kids would be asked to look at the Eastern Front, other kids would be asked to look at another aspect of maybe Hitler individually. And then they come together and um, share their knowledge with each other and then come to a group focus. So he said it reduces the individual competitiveness and instead incentivizes kids to work together. And that mm. has shown um, to be, yeah, it's shown to be really effective. Mm. Just on a, on a counterpoint, just generally, when we're trying to change behavior, unfortunately, information and education or knowledge doesn't always have the effects that you would expect on behavior. Mm. So often the problem is not knowing, um, the problem is actually often more uh, motivational or, or context mm -hmm. effects. So mm -hmm. give you a really basic example, you know, think about um, health, you know, I know that eating and drinking lots of alcohol is not good for my health. Uh, I have lots of information on that. That doesn't necessarily mean though that I behave in a manner uh that that is is good for my health so yeah just a point of, of, of caution but i think it's a on the on the optimistic side i think it's something that should be looked at more Fantastic. and it's a really good point on the incentives there alex as well isn't it because the jigsaw education piece the experiments looked at how you needed to incentivize the children to make that work so ultimately they couldn't get the best grades unless they had worked together seen the whole picture and then been assessed collectively so without that incentive and I think that's that's true in a number of other examples we looked at there has to be a mo uh, you know it goes to your area of expertise there has to be a motivator or a, you know an understanding of what will get people to do it as well as the activity itself. Yeah thanks Lauren you know, I'd love to pick this up with you later on but that, that link with motivation is so important because as you said um, uh, as you were saying Alex earlier that the incentive approach is just not going to be sustainable, especially at large scale when you talk about education or things there. Um, I was curious what, just taking Belinda's point a bit further. So we're part of a community at the Conduit. Uh, it can be very, you know, it's a lovely club, but, but many of us have us probably quite progressive views, being honest. Um, it's quite easy to be very right on and kind of say the same things. How can we, in this kind of um, context, how can we take some of the ideas from Poles Apart and apply them to ourselves as members maybe within the community? Oh gosh, so that's a great, I'm going to delve into it very quickly. I'm aware that, and Belinda, thank you for the compliments as well. Um, so a concept that uh, we talk about a bit in the book called preference falsification is the posh political science term for it, but it's where people say one thing in public and another thing in private, um, or think another thing in private. And it can be quite, actually, when you get that happening at scale, you know, which I know the Conduit Club thinks about, that's when you can suddenly get big swings of opinion that some people think are taking them by surprise, when really it's what they've always thought around the kitchen table or, or in private themselves and I would say you know I, I really worry but you know I have a, a good deal of sympathy with many of the large-scale protest movements that are are going on around the world at the minute I worry sometimes that there might be bits of preference falsification going on and I wonder you know within the country could you say everyone's right on are they really is it hard for people to speak up and to say well I'm not certain that I agree with that or you know and and I think that might be a, a rock that is definitely worth lifting the other one might be to you know to do and I know you're still a reasonably new club and a reasonably new community to deliberately do outreach to places that are and um, with people who who are not similar to you and be very deliberate that you want to listen to them and and be open to the fact that you could mm -hmm. could change your mind in that that case so I know it's it's hard in the the pandemic but I think that would be that would be one of the things and and ask people you know what Alex was saying how did they come to the positions that they held um uh, and go from there I'll, I'll pass over to, to Laura and Alex who I'm sure will want to pick up on some of the the other ideas in the book too yeah I just wanted to share an observation on that actually in terms of how people's viewpoints obviously can then surprise you you know for work we did a an event with Sir Graham Brady the 1922 committee who was very concerned about all of the issues that we've talked about today we had an offline conversation about it did I expect him to be so concerned about those things? Perhaps I was guilty of not thinking so because of the public positioning. So I think there really is something about not taking those assumptions with you, trying to have conversations with people regardless of how you view their standpoint and edging into it a bit. You know, as we said at the outset, trying to find out the bits that you have in common, the bits that everybody is concerned about and using that to bring out rather than, you know, going straight in with a very... Uh, hard opinion i suppose because people can surprise you if you give them the chance alex i don't know if you want to add anything i suppose well, the only thing i was i was gonna going to add to that is actually intervening where you know people might not mm. or might be might mm. be going into their own sort of like 
familial bonds and not not picking mm. things up so when people say oh well you know that is you know I'll, I'll use an example here that i hope alex won't mind me might me discussing when they say like oh people who are standing for election god like you know there's just so many attacks from the right on people from the left and you know alex told us this story as we were deciding to start to write the book about when she stood for election and she was out with her daughter canvassing and you know Alex said a, a blue rose out on and this is in Guildford right you know which is you know not really any longer known known for being the rough mean streets of the world um <laughs> I recognize there's some poverty there but you know it, it, it's not it's not awful and um and someone threw bricks at her like mm. and that's not not and at her daughter, you know, and they were like, or spitting at them and swearing at, mm -hmm. like, what earth is going on when that's happening, you know? And I think actually, people picking people up and being like, hang on, you're classifying everybody on our side as good and everybody on the other side as bad. And life is much, much more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even after writing the book, I can still feel myself do it sometimes. That's extremely mm -hmm. natural. But one of the great things you can do is, is help pick other people up because someone from your own side challenging you can often be a much more effective messenger mm. people are more open to hear it than someone from the other side really? and i think that's very true in a less intense way perhaps in the workplace as well you know when we form groups or teams to look at things it's very easy to think i'll select this group of people and subconsciously you might be doing it because you think they think the same sort of things as you do you know bring someone into the mix who definitely doesn't who definitely doesn't yeah. share that view who's going to ask all the good and the hard questions because it makes you all work harder and you get better yeah. outcomes and more innovative outcomes at the same time yeah, yeah well, we would I was going to say, when we were doing the research for the book, we spoke to quite a few very senior business leaders and not one of them told us that they, other than people in public affairs teams, not one of them told us that um, they have a thought about political diversity when they were building teams they think about race and they think about gender and actually you can end up with a bunch of people who all have quite similar backgrounds and quite yeah. similar viewpoints when you do that and in fact you're tending to do so so there's a, another piece of research which i know i certainly have been guilty of which is if you see diversity in one sphere particularly one that that matters to you you can be blind to a lack of diversity in others which mm -hmm. is why when i walk into a room with a bunch of women in it i think this is great this is really diverse they could all be white and completely agree with me but i will be adamant that that's quite a diverse view until I take a step back mm -hmm. and think about it and and I think for a lot of a lot of leaders that's something that they could could think about a bit more thanks thanks Ali so I know we're wrapping up now I'm just gonna um, hand over to you in a second just to, to suggest to the audience any links or ways we can stay in touch with you but just want to say first of all just commend you all from writing this book together I found writing with myself hard enough um but trying to do with three <laughs> and trying to bring out I think you role model beautifully the idea of bring different um ideas and perspectives together so uh Fantastic book. I'm just going to show it up here again. Uh, but um, but uh, yeah, anyway, how, how do we stay in touch uh, with, with you all and your, your really interesting work? Yeah, so you could hopefully you might be able to see the screen at the end of the presentation. Happy to share that. It's got our contact details on Twitter. The website for the book is wearepolesapart.com. Uh, for people who want to test themselves a little bit, there's a quiz on there <laughs> based on the last British election survey, which gives you know fairly randomised information about people and asks you to predict how they'd vote. And, and we find a lot of people find that very tough because they mm -hmm. take a cue from something. You know, they'll see that someone I know is, is Sikh or that they're a young woman or that and presume they know or they're a lever and they'll know how they're going to vote and that's often not the case so i find that that can be a really powerful way for people to to dislocate and don't worry too i think the average score at the minute is three out of seven and mm -hmm. in fact the more politically informed people think they are the harder they often find it so don't worry if you come out the other end and you're like oh my word that was hard that's the point thanks so much guys so that, a really fascinating discussion as, as people on the panel have been saying and this will go around the Conduit community as well, and hope we can all take these ideas forward within the Conduit and and beyond. But thanks so much for a really engaging discussion, and best of luck for the rest of the book tour. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Bye. Pleasure. Bye. Bye. Bye.